أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 183 سورة النور آية number 41 to 46 ألم ترى أن الله يسبح له من في السماوات والأرض Do you not see that Allah is exalted by whoever is within the heavens and the earth? Everything that is in the heavens and the earth, what does it do? It glorifies Allah. It exalts Allah. In these ayat, there is illustration, detail of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the munawwir of the heavens and the earth. Earlier we learned about Nur as in Hidayah That how is his Hidayah What happens to a person who receives that guidance And what happens to the person who does not receive that guidance As for the rest of the creation How does Allah guide that creation What does that creation do That is illustrated in these ayat That alam tara Did you not see Have you not seen uh, This is Hamza Istifham And it is for the purpose of su'al But when Hamza istifham is followed by nafi, a word of negation, like over here it is being followed by lam, then it turns into isbat, meaning it gives the meaning of Hamza to be of isbat, so alam gives the meaning of qad. Alam together, what meaning does it convey? Qad, meaning certainly, of course. So alam tara, have you not seen, have you not known, Meaning of course, قَدْ رَأَيْتَ You have seen, you know about this, you see this all the time. So, أَلَمْ تَرَ Do you not know? And تَرَ رُؤْيَ This is used for seeing, whether a person is seeing with his eyes, or he is observing something in his mind, he is reflecting on something in his mind. It includes knowledge as well. Because when a person sees, that is a means of obtaining knowledge, that is a means of learning about something. This is why inna sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula even basar will be questioned that what are you seeing what are you observing what are you thinking about what are you taking into your mind so alam tara have you not seen meaning you have seen you know about this that anna allah that indeed allah yusabbihu lahu it glorifies for him yusabbihu from tasbih and tasbih is to proclaim the purity, the perfection, the glory, the praise of someone. And obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who deserves that. So, يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ Meaning it proclaims His sanctity, proclaims His perfection, proclaims His glory and His praise. Who? مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Whoever that is in the heavens and the earth. Meaning, Every creation, every khalq that is in the skies and that is in the earth. What is it doing? It's glorifying Allah. Now, when it comes to creation, remember that there's two types of creation. One is such creation that is aqil, that has an intellect, that has a mind, that is able to understand, that is able to analyze, and that also has free will. Some of those creations, they also have free will. So for example, amongst the aqil creation, there are angels. They don't have free will. However, they have mind, they have understanding, they have reason. Which is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that I am going to create a khalifa, I'm going to create Adam, what did they say? That are you going to create someone who's going to create fasad in the earth? So this shows that the angels, they have reason. They have intellect, they have a mind. And amongst the aqil creation is also human beings as well as the jinn. Because both of them, they have the ability to analyze, they have the ability to understand, and they also have free will, unlike the angels. So this is one type of creation. The other type of creation is ghair aqil. What does it mean by that? Creation that does not have reason, does not have mind, does not have an intellect with which they analyze, with which they understand, And this includes, like for example, the mountains, the rocks, the clouds. They just do whatever they are programmed to do. And it also includes animals, as well as insects, as well as birds. Now you may say, but many of the animals are very clever, very smart. Yes, they are smart. But if you try to explain the ayat of Allah to them, will they understand? 
No. They will not. They will learn certain patterns and behaviors when you repeatedly try to teach them. Like for example, you can train a dog, you can train a cat, you can train an animal, you can train a monkey as well. However, if you try to explain a concept to them, will they understand? No. They might be able to repeat exactly as you have said, like a parrot. But does he comprehend what he's saying? Not necessarily. So one type of creation is aqil and the other type of creation is ghair aqil. Over here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Whoever that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah. What does it mean? Every creation whether aqil or ghair aqil, what is it doing? Doing tasbih of Allah. Now as for aqil creation, understood that human beings, angels, jinn, what do they do? They do tasbih of Allah. They say subhanallah. Human beings amongst them, those who are believers, when they pray, subhanallah, subhanahu rabbi al-azim, subhanahu rabbi al-a'la, they glorify Allah. Jinn also amongst them, those who are believers, they do that. The angels also, وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ The angels also do that. So, but what about that creation which does not have aql, غير aql, how do they glorify Allah? I had mentioned this to you earlier as well, that when it comes to doing tasbih of Allah, it can be done in two ways. First of all, in maqal, meaning by words. That they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by words, like for example, human beings, angels, jinn. And secondly, tasbih is also done by hal, by the state that a particular creation is in. Like for example, if a mountain is fixed on its place, it does not move. It's a towering, huge mountain that is stabilizing the crust of the earth. It does not say anything. You cannot hear any sounds coming out from its mouth. You cannot. However, its state, the state that the mountain is in, it is glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that state. How? That the mountain, it reflects the perfection of Allah. It reflects the great knowledge, the great ability, the great power, the great care and affection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for His creation. That look at the huge mountains that He has created. Look at the wisdom that these mountains are so deep, they're stabilizing the crust of the earth. Look at the love and the affection that Allah has for His creation that live on the earth. So the state of the mountain, what is that doing? Glorifying Allah. Mentioning, proclaiming the glory of Allah. Proclaiming the perfection of Allah. Praising Allah. So, يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ How? In maqal and also in hal. Now as for the creation that is in the skies, in the heavens, which creation is there? Like for example the angels. Right? Similarly in the skies, there are many other creations that we do not know of. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو None knows about his junood except him. As for the creation that is on the earth, what is included in that? Everything that we see. Whether we have discovered it or we have not discovered it. It includes human beings. It includes the animals. It includes the insects. It includes the mountains and the birds and the fish in the sea and the various types of creatures that exist in the sea, above the water, you know, on land, in mountains, inside mountains. Trees, vegetation, plants, all of them, they're included in what? In the creation that exists in the earth. And the creation in the skies, the creation in the earth, all of them are busy glorifying Allah. In Surah Al Isra, ayah number 44, we learn, تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ السَّبْعُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنَّ That the seven heavens and the earth, and whatever is in them, what do they do? They exalt Allah. They do his tasbih. وَإِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِحَهُمْ And there is not a thing except that it exalts Allah by his praise. There is not a single thing except that what is it doing? Exalting Allah by his praise. But you do not understand their way of exalting. You do not understand how they're doing tasbih. You don't know what they're saying. This morning only after Fajr, I had the windows open and I could hear the birds chirping. And at that time I noticed that you know you only hear this kind of chirping in the morning. Right? You don't you don't hear this kind of chirping the rest of the day. 
unless something has happened. Then you will hear the birds chirping. But otherwise, this chirping you hear only in the morning. So Allahu A'lam, we don't know what the birds are saying, but it's some kind of tasbih that they're doing. Similarly, we learn in Surah Al-Hajj, ayah number 18, that أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَسْجُدُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ that do you not see that to Allah prostrates whoever is in the heavens and whoever is in the earth. So we see that all the creation, it is doing the tasbih of Allah, glorifying Allah, and at the same time, it is also in prostration to Allah. In other words, the entire creation, the entire creation is obedient to Allah. The entire creation is under Allah, obedient to Allah. Glorifying Allah by words, by their state, and they have also submitted to Him. And in the same ayah, Surah Al-Hajj, ayah 18, that was shamsu wal qamaru wal nujumu wal jibalu wal shajaru wal dawabu wa kathiru min al nas. And the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains and the trees and the creatures and many among the people, all of them, what do they do? Prostrate before Allah. And as for the glorification of the mountains, we learn that وَسَخَّرْنَا مَعَ دَاوُودَ الْجِبَالَ يُسَبِّحْنَا وَالطَّيْرِ That Dawood السلام, whenever he would do tasbih, the mountains, they would do tasbih along with him. And we have learned in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 74, that وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَحْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ That of the rocks, there are those that fall down out of the fear of Allah. So yes, these creatures that are inanimate, we feel that they're nothing. We feel that they cannot do anything. They don't have any sense. But what do we learn? They have the awareness of who their creator is. They have the self-awareness. And at the same time, they have submitted before Allah. They fear Allah. They love Allah. We learn in Surah Al-Hashr, Ayah 21, that لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ that if we had sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and coming apart out of the fear of Allah. So when you look at the creation of Allah, don't consider it to be things that are useless, things that do not have any sense, things that do not do anything. No. They love Allah. They have fear of Allah. They glorify Allah. They prostrate to Allah. And if we human beings, if we don't do so, then what is our status then? Then we are lower than the mountains. We are lower than the rocks. We are lower than birds and animals who at least prostrate to Allah in whatever capacity that they can. وَالطَّيْرُ صَافَّاتٍ And the birds with their wings outstretched. Meaning, and the birds also do tasbih of Allah. The word طَيْر is a plural of طَائِر. And according to some linguists, the word طَيْر is also used for singular. But over here, it will be understood as plural in this context. And the birds, they have been mentioned separately over here. Why do you think so? After mentioning whoever is in the skies and whoever is in the earth, they glorify Allah. And then after that, birds are mentioned separately. Why? Because they are suspended between the earth and the sky. Because in particular, what is mentioned? وَالطَيْرُ صَافَّاتٍ That with their wings outstretched, meaning when they're flying, then they're not upon the earth, nor are they up in the sky. Where are they? In between. And these birds also, what do they do? They do the spear of Allah. How? We don't understand. But what do we know? That they definitely do the spear. And Sulaiman a.s. What do we learn about him? That ulimna mantiqatayr. That we have been taught the language of the birds, the speech of the birds. It shows that the birds also they have some way of communication. They have some language. And they use that, why? For what purpose? To glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you look at it, human beings are the most expressive. They have so many languages, so many words. An ordinary person can have such a huge vocabulary. A child can have such a huge vocabulary. But we have to see that in our daily speech, in our vocabulary, how much is it that we do tasbih of Allah? Because the birds are doing tasbih, are we doing tasbih? But the birds, how have they been mentioned over here? That what title Safat in Safat is a plural of Safa. From the root letters? Safa fa. And the word Safa can be understood in two ways. First of all, Safa as in one that is in a Saf. 
one that is in a row. So صافات, ones that are lined up, ones that are arranged in a row, in a line, in ranks. ثُمَّ أَتُوا صَفَّا That all of you come in rows. So صافات, ones in rows. So what does this mean then? That the birds when they fly together, how do they fly? How? In rows, in lines. And you may have seen many times, When birds are migrating, especially this scene is very common over here, as winter is approaching, as summer is approaching, you see birds leaving, you see birds coming back, especially the geese. How do you see them? Flying in lines, in like a V form. And secondly, صفات is understood as صفا يصفو, meaning when the birds, they spread their wings in flight. When the birds spread out their wings in flight. So صفات, meaning ones that are spreading and outstretching their wings in air as they are flying. We learn in Surah Mulk, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ صَافَاتٍ وَيَقْبِضٍ That do they not see the birds above them in the sky as they fly? That صَافَاتٍ with their wings outstretched and then وَيَقْبِضٍ And then they close them in. So constantly they are expanding and contracting their wings as they fly. So وَالطَّيْرُ صَافَاتٍ And as they are flying in rows with their wings outstretched, what are they doing? Glorifying Allah. What do we see? That even when birds are traveling, what do they do? They don't waste their time. They do the speech of Allah. What do we do if we're traveling in a plane? What do we do? We spend our time watching stuff, listening to stuff, things that may not be that useful at all. So look at the way that these birds spend their time doing the speech of Allah. So we should also learn from that. We see that certain types of geese, they have been seen flying over the highest peaks of the Himalayas, above 8,000 meters. This is how high they fly sometimes. Also we see that approximately 1,800 of the world's 10,000 bird species, they are long distance migrants. Just imagine, 1,800 species of birds What do they do? They migrate. Long distance. And sometimes this migration of theirs in which they're flying, it's non-stop. They don't stop even once. They don't stop at all. So, وَالطَّيْرُ صافات. كُلٌ All of them. Meaning all that has been mentioned over here. Whatever that is in the skies, whatever that is in the earth, and the birds that are suspended between the earth and the sky. قَدْ عَلِمَ Each and every single creation. قَدْ عَلِمَ In fact, it knows صَلَاتَهُ It's prayer وَتَسْبِيحَهُ And it's glorification. Every creation knows how to pray to Allah and how to glorify Allah. Every creation knows. What does it mean by that? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since He is the Hadi, since He is the Nuru samawati wal ard, He has taught every creation how to do tasbih as well. And he has put this in the fitra of every single creation. And if you look at it, human beings are not required to teach the creation, to teach the rest of the creation how to do tasbih, how to migrate, how to travel from one place to the other. No. There have been cases where certain species of birds as they're going extinct, people want to help them migrate from one place to the other. And they see that the birds, they take a route that is much more efficient, that they outstrip people. So who has given them this knowledge? Who has given them this way of living, this way of functioning, the way of glorifying Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, كُلَّمْ قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَهُ وَتَسْبِيحَهُ In Surah Taha, Ayah 50, we learn, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى That our Lord is the one who gave each thing its form and then He also guided it. Every creation has also been guided as to what it should do. This is one way of understanding this part of the ayah. Secondly, alima has been understood as He knew, meaning He knows as in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. That kullun, every creation, qad alima, Allah knows. About what? Salatahu, about its prayer, wa tasbihahu, and its glorification. Meaning any creation that ever does the speech of Allah, that ever prays to Allah, Allah knows about it. Allah hears all prayers. 
He listens to every tasbih. قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَهُ وَتَسْبِيحَهُ Now what's the difference between salat and tasbih? Salat, prayer, and in particular it has been said that a salat refers to the salat of let's say human beings or jinn or angels. And tasbih, this is general, that how every creation whether aqil or ghayr aqil is glorifying Allah. So Allah knows about every glorification that is done for Him. Wallahu alimun and Allah is knowing bima yafalun of whatever that they do. Yafalun they is not just human beings, but all of the creation that has been mentioned over here. So what do we see in this ayah? That the entire universe, the entire universe is obedient to Allah, is humble before Allah, has completely surrendered before Him. And this is the fitrah. This is the nature with which every single creation has been created. That every creation is naturally inclined to submitting before Allah. But who has been given the free will? Human beings and the jinn. And in them also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept this desire. He has kept this thirst, that this quest for truth, for who God is, for why am I here? What is my purpose in life? So many amongst people, even they have submitted, but many have forgotten. As the ayah in Surah Al-Hajj tells us that وَكَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَكَثِيرٌ حَقَّ عَلَيْهِ الْعَذَابِ That many amongst people, they do sajda to Allah. But many amongst people, adab is justified against them. So we see that there are many people who have submitted before Allah and there are some people who have not submitted to Allah. And we also see that there are some people who are very particular about their tasbih, about their prayers, that no matter where they go, whether they go to a park, school, university, whether they're at home, whether it's their wedding day, whether someone has died, whether they're very busy, what will they do? They will pray on time. But there are other people who neglect the salah, who neglect tasbih at the slightest excuse. Slightest excuse. I know of somebody who prays five times a day in the masjid. I mean, this is their priority. They have to pray in the masjid. And the day that they were getting married, everything was scheduled around the salah times. And salah times, not as in we'll have a 15-minute break and we'll have a jama'ah. No, I have to go to the masjid. It has to be around the time of masjid. So for example, when they were leaving, it had to be at a time when they could easily make it to the masjid. So there are some people who are very, very particular, who give priority to their salah and to their tasbih. And other people, they're not that concerned. They don't give it that much priority. But other people, they get distracted by the slightest of things. So what do we see? That the entire creation is busy glorifying Allah, worshipping Allah. And the same is also expected of human beings. That it happens sometimes that if we are of those few people who worship Allah, who pray to Allah, who do tasbih, who study the Qur'an, who read the Qur'an, we feel left out. We feel alone. We feel lonely. Isn't it so? Like for example, in this surah, many commands have been given. For example, the command of hijab. If we start wearing it, we might feel left out. We might feel that we're the only ones at family gatherings who have something on their heads who are wearing an abaya, we might feel alone. It's possible that we go somewhere and we're the only ones who come out of class to pray salah. It happens, right? But at that time, don't feel bad. Remind yourself that, okay, the ground that I'm praying on, this ground has submitted before Allah. This earth is doing the tasbih of Allah. Everything is doing the tasbih of Allah. Everything is worshipping Allah. So what if these people don't? I should never feel alone. Always remind yourself, sky above me, these clouds above me, these trees that surround me, the grass that is below, everything is doing tasbih. So what if I'm the only human being? I'm not alone. I'm not alone. This is one of the ways of checking yourself. That are you afraid of praying before people? Are you afraid of getting up to go and pray salah? Just because people will look at you, people will give you that look, and people will think that you're very extreme, and you're going to lose out. No. Don't feel like that. Because the entire universe is loyal to Allah. The entire universe is obedient to Allah. 
And if I am also obedient to Allah, I am not alone. I am not the only one. There are many who have submitted to Allah. So many times we come across things like a tree, a rock, and we think of a rock as a rock. It's a rock after all. What's so special about it? But if I'm not praying, if I don't do tasbih, if I don't glorify Allah, if I don't praise Allah, then that rock is better than me. And it's actually very embarrassing. It should embarrass us. That imagine this rock knows how to do tasbih, and I don't know how to do tasbih of Allah. This rock knows what kind of worship it has to do, and I don't even know how to read the Qur'an. I don't even know what I'm saying. Because many times we pray salah, we recite the Qur'an, we read the adhkar, but we have no idea about what we're saying. But what do we learn? كُلٌ قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَهُ وَتَسْبِيحَهُ Ilm is not just about what to do, knowing about what to do. Ilm is knowing what you are doing. The meaning of what you're doing, the understanding of that as well. So it should embarrass us that the ground that we're prostrating on, it knows what it's supposed to do. And I, as a human being who has been given a mind, who has been given free will, who has been given the ability to go here, there, listen, learn, look, see, comprehend, I don't know how to do the tasbih of Allah. I don't know the meaning of salah. I don't know the meaning of Qur'an. How embarrassing would it be? This is why the human being becomes asfala safirin, the lowest of the low. That his rank becomes lower than that of the rocks even. Sometimes, you know, we go to a place and uh, we want to pray. They give us a small room, a corner somewhere to pray. And we feel so closed in and we feel so lonely. We feel so alone. But at that time, think about it. O walls, O ground, you become my witness on the Day of Judgment. Sometimes you have to go outside of a building to pray. And as you're praying over there, tell yourself, talk to the earth, to the grass, to the trees, that you be my witness on the Day of Judgment. I remember once we were traveling through some mountains once and there was a huge water stream in the middle and there were huge rocks in the middle as well. And I saw a man, he was praying on a rock, like a huge rock in the middle of the river. It was very huge. He was standing on top of it and he was praying. And it was such a beautiful scene. I was like, this rock is going to be a witness for him on the Day of Judgment. That all of this creation, it's glorifying Allah, it's doing salat, it's praising Allah, worshipping Allah. And if we also worship Allah, then we are becoming a part of majority. Remember, you don't become a minority when you worship Allah. You become a part of majority. And just remember, Wallahu بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَفْعَلُونَ Allah is knowing. وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. What does it mean by that? That He is the Malik. He is the owner. لِلَّهِ mulk. To Him belongs the mulk, the kingdom, the kingship, the dominion, the possession, ownership of the heavens and the earth. All of the heavens and the earth, they belong to who? Allah. He is the owner. It is His decisions that are carried out. His commands that have to be implemented. He is their creator. He is their owner. He is their planner. He is the one who runs them. He is the one who functions them. Just like a king of a country, like the president of a nation, what is he required to do? To sit there on his throne? No. He's supposed to run the entire place, govern the affairs. And similarly, he has authority as well. Whatever he says, that is what is done. So imagine Allah's mulk is of as-samawat wal-ard. And He is Al-Qawi, He is Al-Qadir, He is the one who is powerful, He is the one who is all able to carry out whatever He wants, to do whatever He wants. وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ And to Allah is Al-Masir, the return, the destination. The word Masir is both Masdar as well as Ism Zarf, from the word Sayr or Sayrura, which is to return. So Al-Masir, the return or the place at which one arrives. The place of destination. So why ila Allah al Why to Allah is the destination? For recompense. As we learn in Surah Al-Najm, Ayah 31, that وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. 
لیجزی الذین اساؤوا بما عملوا ویجزی الذین احسنوا بالحسنى that he may recompense those who do evil with the penalty of what they have done and recompense those who do good with the best reward so he is the owner he is the one who has created everything he is the one who owns everything and everything is going back to him everything is going to be judged by him so we will be held accountable for what we have done that did we learn how to do tasbih or not when we learned did we do tasbih or not did we obey allah or not alam tara do you not see anna allah that indeed allah yuzji sahaban he is the one who drives the clouds yuzji is from the root letters zai jim wow zai jim wow zaja yasju is to be easy it is to urge gently to propel to move forward and isja is to push something so that it propels forward to urge something on so that it keeps going so that it keeps going forward like for example if there is a camel it is driven from behind and also from the front but in particular isja is to drive something from behind to push something from behind so that it keeps going it keeps running and from this is the word zajwan as well which is to drive something we have learned earlier that rabbukum alladhi yuzji lakum alfulka your lord is the one who drives for you the ships meaning he propels them forward for you in the sea rajulun muzjan rajulun muzjan is a person who is repelled you know he is pushed off he is weak he is insignificant he doesn't have much say he doesn't have much importance and from this the word muzjatin is also used for something that is insignificant do you remember the word muzjatin bi bidaatin muzjatin surah yusuf that when the brothers of yusuf alayhi salam they came back what did they say that we have come to you with a very insignificant price with a very insignificant in a merchandise so just take it from us accept it from us and give us food in return and tasaddaq alayna so anna allah yuzji meaning he drives and he pushes them forward so that they smoothly keep moving on what sahaban clouds so these clouds that we see moving up in the sky who is moving them who is telling them to move allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summa yu'allifu bainahu then he joins between it yu'allifu from the root letters hamza lam fa allafa yu'allifu ta'lif is to combine together to unite together to join together we make the dua allahumma allif bayna qulubina join our hearts right so yu'allifu bainahu meaning he joins all of these clouds together he combines them together that all of these clouds are scattered in the sky small small pieces of clouds they are scattered in the sky but what happens he drives them and they keep moving on until what happens you allifu bainahu they are all joined together summa yaj'aluhu then he makes it meaning all of these different different clouds that have joined together as they join together what happens they become rukaman layer upon layer a heap of clouds a pile of clouds meaning they assemble together vertically you understand they assemble together vertically because rukam is from the root letters ra kaf mim and rukam is used for a pile of something when something is heaped up when something is put in a stack one on top of the other one on top of the other in a stack so summa yaj'aluhu rukama he makes these clouds into a heaped up into a heaped up huge vertical cloud fatara then you see al wadqa the rain drops al wadq from the root letters waw dal qaf the singular of which is wadqa and it is said that al wadq is used for rain any type of rain whether it is very heavy or it is very light whether it comes in the form of a downpour or in the form of a drizzle it's used for any type of rain drops so fatara al wadqa so you see the rain drops yakhruju min khilalihi coming out from between it from between what from between the clouds that you don't see the clouds falling apart what do you see 
raindrops coming out of the clouds. Khilal is the distance, the gap between two things. So from between the clouds, you see raindrops falling down. وَيُنَزِّلُ And he sends down. مِنَ السَّمَاءِ From the sky. From the sky, he sends down. مِنْ جِبَالٍ From mountains. فِيهَا That are in it. That are where? The mountains that are in the sky. What does it mean by that? The mountains that are in the sky. Mountains over here, this is not literal. Because remember the word Jibal, it is used for mountains that we see. But it is also used as an expression for the kathra, the abundance as well as the azmah, the greatness of something. That when something is in large quantities or when something is huge in its size, then the word Jibal is also used to describe that. Like for example, it is said, عِنْدَهُ جِبَالٌ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ That so and so person has a mountain of knowledge. Meaning a lot of knowledge. Similarly, it is said, فُلَانٌ يَمْلِكُ جِبَالٌ مِنْ ذَهَبٌ So and so owns a mountain of gold. Meaning a lot of gold. So over here, مِنْ جِبَالٍ This has been understood in various ways. First of all, it has been said that وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ جِبَالٍ Sama gives the meaning of height. Not the sky, but height. Meaning what is above people in height. And in that case, we will understand Jibal to be the mountains that we see on the earth. Because they are taller than us. Isn't it so? The, the mountains are taller than us. So from these mountains, what happens? Fiha min baradin, hail, meaning snow or ice, it comes down. So for example, on the mountains, what happens? Snow settles in. There are glaciers. But what happens to those glaciers eventually? They melt. Or they come downwards. Or for example, an avalanche happens. Like for example, a snowball forms into a huge avalanche. So from the mountains come down, also, water in various forms. Others have said that, no, Jibal over here means huge, towering, mountain-like clouds that are in the sky. Mountain-like clouds that are in the sky. That are very tall in their vertical height. So, وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ جِبَالٍ And the mountains that are in the sky, meaning huge, tall, mountain-like clouds, He sends down from them, مِنْ بَرَدْ Hail. Hailstones. So, we see that hailstones... They don't fall down from just any mountain. They fall down from any cloud. But rather they fall down from huge clouds, massive clouds. And Barad in particular is used for hailstones. And remember that such clouds from which hail comes down, they are not ordinary clouds. They are known as the cumulonimbus clouds. And they can be 20,000 meters in their height. On average... 20,000 meters in their vertical height. We're not talking about their width. We're talking about their height. They can be that tall. So the hailstones that come down from such mountains. For Yusibu Bihi, then he reaches with it. Meaning, the hailstones that are sent down from these clouds, these are made to reach man yasha, whomever he wills. Meaning, whoever Allah wills. Meaning, when the hailstones fall down from the sky, they don't fall down at random. They either come as mercy or as punishment. As mercy or as difficulty. Because for يُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He selects, he chooses on whom the hailstones should fall down. He selects مَنْ يَشَاءُ It's up to him. That it could be someone's crop, it could be someone's land, it could be someone's house, it could be someone's car. And sometimes it happens that hailstones are so huge. And they fall with so much speed that literally they could leave a mark on your car. They could break the windows on your car, the windshield of your car. And if they hit people, they can literally leave a mark on the head. So for يُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَصْرِفُهُ And he turns it away. عَمَّنْ يَشَاءُ From whomever he wills. It's up to him. يَكَادُ It is near. That سَنَا بَرْقِهِ The flash of its lightning. سَنَا from the root letters. سِين نُون واو and sana yasnu is the flash, the gleam of a very bright light, glare. So over here, sana 
is used for flash. So the flash of barqihi, of its lightning, meaning the lightning of these mountains, it is so strong, it is so bright, that yadhabu bil absar. It would almost take away the vision of people. It would almost cause people to become blind. It's as bright. So what do we see in this ayah? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something which reflects His power, which reflects His ability, which reflects that He has the mulk of the skies as well as the earth. He is the one who is the owner of the heavens as well as the earth. It is His decision. It is His commands that are implemented, that are carried out. And in this ayah in particular, what do we see? How clouds form and how rain comes down from them and how hail stones also come down from these clouds. If you look at it, such concepts, like for example the water cycle, the process of precipitation, you've learned about it in school. It's taught widely in schools at different stages, at different ages, different levels, at various levels of detail. All of these things are mentioned. However, what is missing? What is missing from all that detail? Who is doing this? Who is causing this to happen? So, it's studied widely in great detail, but what is neglected is the power and the might of Allah. And we see that in the Qur'an, the same things are mentioned. Perhaps the same details are also mentioned, but from a different angle. It mentions lessons. And most importantly, it shows that this is the power of Allah. So if you look at this ayah, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُزْجِي سَحَابًا Allah is the one who drives the clouds. And then these clouds, what happens? ثُمَّ يُؤَلِّفُ بَيْنَهُ ثُمَّ يَجَعَلُهُ رُكَامًا That the clouds, He is the one who causes them to rise up from the earth. He causes the water to be evaporated. And then what happens? As this water evaporates, forms into clouds, and these clouds, they come together, forming huge clouds. And these huge clouds, they are such from which rain falls down and from which hail also comes down. And these are not ordinary clouds, as I mentioned to you. They are in particular the cumulonimbus clouds. And these clouds in particular, they are involved in thunderstorms and which bring a lot of rain, which bring snow, and they also bring hail. And these clouds, they can form alone and they can also form in clusters. So sometimes you have a huge Cumulonimbus cloud, only one, but sometimes you have several. And you may have noticed that if you're traveling by air sometimes, you will see such clouds. They are so huge. They literally have a mushroom shape. They're massive. They're huge. And they grow vertically instead of horizontally. And many of them, they have this mushroom shape, meaning they're small from their base, but they're much bigger. They're much more wide towards the top. And the base of a typical of an average cumulonimbus cloud can be several miles. The base itself can be several miles, which is why if you're ever flying by a cloud such as this, you're flying and flying and flying, and then eventually what happens? You pass it. right? So the base itself can be several miles across. And its peak can reach up to 75,000 feet. Its peak, its height can be how, how tall? 75,000 feet. But on average, it's usually 20,000 feet. So it can go up to 75,000, but typically it's 20,000 feet only. And we see that the temperatures in such clouds are below freezing. They're below zero degrees. They're below freezing levels. Which is why the raindrops in them, they turn into snowflakes or they turn into hailstones because of the intense energy that is in these clouds and also the air pressure over there and the extreme temperatures, what happens to the water drops is they're moved constantly in these clouds. And as they move, what happens? A layer of water comes on them, it freezes, and then another layer which freezes, and then another layer which freezes. Which is why sometimes you will see hailstones which are very tiny, and sometimes you will see them as very huge. Sometimes they're very, very big. And we see that hailstones can grow up to 15 centimeters. They can be 15 centimeters in their diameter and they can weigh more than one pound. Just imagine. They can go up to this much weight and this much size. But on average, they are 5 millimeters or more. And typically, they're the size of, an, of a golf ball 
So you can imagine how big they can be. And imagine if they hit somebody on their head, if they hit on the car, if they hit on your window, how much of a disaster this could cause. So for يُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَصْرِفُهُ عَمَّنْ يَشَاءُ He hits whomever he wills, and he takes it away from whoever he wills. This is also very interesting. يَصْرِفُهُ عَمَّنْ يَشَاءُ It's going, but then يَصْرِفُهُ Because sometimes what happens? You get this alert. Thunderstorms tomorrow. Snowstorm that will bring this much snow. Right? We have all these big warnings. Sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't. Why? Because ultimately... It's in the hands of Allah. He can send a storm a particular way and then He can divert its direction completely. فَيُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَصْرِفُهُ عَمَّنْ يَشَاءُ And then يَكَادُ سَنَا بَرْقِهِ يَذْهَبُ بِالْأَبْصَارِ Because with all the hail, the rain, sometimes there is also a lot of lightning. And this lightning is also very amazing. I just mentioned to you that the clouds, the inside temperature is below freezing. But isn't it amazing? that from the same clouds comes out lightning, which when it strikes the earth, it can cause fire. Isn't that amazing? From something that's so cold, something that's so hot is coming out. And a flash of lightning, a single lightning bolt, is about 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or five times hotter than the surface of the sun. This is how hot it is. And... It's so strong that a lightning bolt is anywhere from 1 million to 10 million volts. Just imagine how strong it is. And the thickness of a lightning bolt is about the size of a silver dollar. This is how wide it is in reality. But it appears to be very big. Why? Because of its brightness. And it's so bright that if you look at it sometimes, you will feel as though your vision will go. So what does this ayah illustrate? The great power of Allah. The great ability of Allah. At the beginning we learn, everything is humble before Him. And over here, what do we see? That how powerful is He? What He shows to us to demonstrate His power to us. If you think, why is this mentioned in Surah An-Nur? Why is this mentioned in the Surah where so many commands have been given at the beginning of the Surah, in the middle of the Surah, at the end of the Surah? That these commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to us that we are learning about, we must realize the importance of implementing these commands. That these are not instructions that are coming from a human being. No. These are commands that are coming to us from Allah, who is so powerful that He causes such huge mountain-like clouds to form up in the sky. And from them He sends down hail, He sends down snow, He sends down raindrops which can cause so much disaster and that can also cause so much benefit to people. If you remember at the beginning of the surah, we learned suratun anzalnaha. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that we have revealed it? Meaning realize the importance of these commands. You don't have any choice. This is coming from Allah. If you obey, there will be benefit. And if you disobey, realize the one who you were disobeying. Realize that. So all of these ayat, they demonstrate the power, the great power of Allah, so that we can become humble, so that we can obey the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to us. More illustration of His power. 